In the previous video, we introduced the idea of natural boundary conditions, so we don't know the value of u at the endpoints of our domain, say x0, x1. So instead, we had to get those boundary conditions, and they arose naturally from the derivation of the Euler equation. Here we're going to look at a situation where the natural boundary condition arises in a slightly different setting. So this is called a dual functional, and it's where we have our normal functional, which is a definite integral over the entire domain, but we also have dual means two, so there's two pieces. We also have the function u of x at one or more of the endpoints being included in the functional. So that gives us the two terms that give rise to this term, dual functional. So how do we treat a situation like that? Well, unfortunately, we actually have to do cases like this by taking the variation of i, setting it equal to zero to get the natural boundary conditions. We can't use the normal form of the natural boundary conditions that we derived in the last video, so we have to get them from scratch in every case by specifying that delta i is equal to zero. So let's show how we could do that in an example. So let me first motivate where such a function might arise from. So remember in our motivational example as well as our last video when we introduced the idea of a natural boundary condition, we're thinking about this river crossing trajectory problem. We have the left bank of the river, the right bank of the river. We want to get across the river in the minimum amount of time. The first version, we start at a known point, x0, u0, and we end at a known point on the other bank, x1, u1. So fixed boundary conditions on both sides. And then we said, well, what if I just want to get across the river in minimum time? I actually don't care where I end up on the right bank. So I know what x1 is, but I don't know what u1 is. And that's what gave rise to the natural boundary condition. Well, let's say we had a slightly different scenario where I start at a point x0, u0 on the left bank of the river, but I want to get as close to my cabin on the right bank of the river as I can because I have to carry my boat where I get out of the water to my cabin. So say my cabin is at u is equal to zero. So I want to be as close to upstream or downstream, I don't care, but I want to be as close to that location as I can. So now we have two objectives. One is to get across the river as quickly as we can, and the second is to minimize the distance from my cabin. So in order to do that, say this would be that functional that is the time across the river. It's not, it's much simpler than the one that we derived in chapter one. In any case, it would be a definite integral that looks something like this. And then this, the u at 1 squared is minimizing the distance, and we square it because I don't care if the distance is positive or negative if, if I'm downstream or upstream of my cabin. So I square it in order to strip off the sign and minimize just the distance. So those are my two objectives that give rise to the dual functional. Obviously, they could arise in many other scenarios as well, but just to continue this river crossing trajectory theme that we've been developing. Okay, so as I said, the only way to get the natural boundary condition for a situation like this is to actually take the variation of the dual functional, set it equal to zero, and get the natural boundary conditions, get the Euler equation. So let's do that. So I want to take the variation of these two terms. Let's do the more familiar definite integral first. Remember the variation of the integral is the same as the integral of the variation as long as the limits of integration do not vary, which they do not in this case. So I can take the variation of u prime squared. So that's two times u prime times delta u prime. Remember the variation of something squared is always two times the something times the variation of the something. The two cancels with the one half and we'll just have u prime times the variation of u prime inside the integral. Now for this term, we have two times u evaluated at one. Now remember, I don't know what u is at one now. That's gonna be part of the solution, so that's why it still varies. So the variation of something squared is two times the something times the variation of the something. So that's two, which cancels with the one half, times u evaluated at one, times the variation of u evaluated at one. So that's what you see here. The u evaluated at one times the variation of u at one, plus our integral of u prime delta u prime, and those have to sum to zero. Now as before, we need to get the derivative off of the delta u here. So we use integration by parts to move this derivative off the delta u onto the u prime. So that gives us the p times q at the endpoints, then minus the integral of q dp, and that has to sum to zero, along with this term that we had from the u at one squared term. So put in the limits here. So we put in one and zero, so this is u prime at one times delta u at one, minus u prime at zero times delta u 
at zero. And before we go any further, let's think about whether we know any of these things and whether they actually do or do not vary. So u at one, I don't know what that is, so that does indeed vary, so those terms have to remain. But u at zero, I actually do know. Okay, that was given to us in the problem statement. I don't think I actually said it, it was u at zero is one. So we know that the variation of u at zero is equal to zero, because u at zero is known. So this term goes away. So now we follow through the normal logic, like, just like we did before. Anything times the variation of something that we don't know, that anything has to be zero by itself. So that gives us the Euler equation, is u double prime is equal to zero, all the way across the domain. And that also gives us the fact that the coefficient times delta u at one, which is u at one plus u prime at one, that also has to vanish in order to get rid of these terms. So we have our Euler equation, u double prime is equal to zero, and we have the natural boundary condition, u at one plus u prime at one is equal to zero. So I've indicated here the other variations that could arise. So again, any coefficient of a variation of something that we don't know, that has to vanish. And that's what I'm emphasizing here, even though they don't apply in this particular case. So we have our Euler equation, u double prime is equal to zero. We have our fixed boundary condition, u at zero is one. And then we have our natural boundary condition, u at one plus u prime at one is equal to zero at x is equal to one. We integrate twice, u double prime is equal to zero, you get a straight line. You apply the boundary conditions and that gives us our two constants and that gives us the stationary function minus a half x plus one. So that is the solution, if this were the river crossing trajectory problem, that minimizes the time as much as possible given the additional objective of getting as close to my cabin as possible. So it doesn't get as close to the cabin as possible, which would be zero, or the shortest time. It combines those two objectives and it gives me the optimal solution that gets as close to reaching those two objectives as possible. And that's the stationary function that does that. Now it turns out that the Euler equation, the u double prime is equal to zero, would arise from taking partial f partial u minus d dx of partial f partial u prime and setting that equal to zero. So, so you do get the Euler equation using the usual technique and you, you can use that to check if you'd like. But in order to get that natural boundary condition right here, the only way to get that is to take the variation of i and set it equal to zero, follow through the integration by parts and see what arises naturally out of that derivation. So far then, we've seen two types of end conditions. In certain cases, we know both the independent variable, x0 and x1, and we know the dependent variable, u0 and u1. So those are our essential fixed Dirichlet boundary conditions. We also saw where we could have x0 and x1 known and fixed, but where u0 and or u1 are not known, so natural boundary conditions. There's actually a third possibility. It's not very common, but in our river crossing trajectory problem, we could see very easily where this might arise. And that's where we have what are called variable end conditions. So where I don't know u0 and u1, nor do I know x0 and or x1. So that would be like if I had my, the banks of my river, but they were curved, okay? So if they were curved, then wherever I start will determine the x0, and wherever I end will determine the x1, but I don't know where the starting and ending point are. So we can treat that, that's done in this next section, variable endpoints. I'm not gonna cover it in one of these videos, but I just want you to know that it is possible to treat such cases, it leads to what are called transversality conditions. So here's a scenario where you have, again, uh, curved boundaries, and I wanna start at a point along here and end at a point along here that minimizes the distance between those. And you can see, depending on where I start and where I end, of course, I'll obviously get different lengths, I wanna choose those points to give me the minimum length. So again, you can go through this section if you'd like and see how it's done. Here's an example with a curved boundary and a straight boundary and the shortest distance between them is a straight line, as always, uh, but I don't know where the beginning and ending points would be, so I have to use this, this approach.